I'm so excited to be here, as I bet you are too. Um, it's not just that his new book, which is this one, what days are for, it's not just that it's perfect, <laughs> it's um, exactly what you want to read, um, and that's how I read it. Thank I just you. said, this book is perfect. Thank you. It's not just that. It's not just that his voice is singular, his knowledge, his wisdom, his sense of humour, his sharpness, his candour, his ways with words and languages. It's that I've had so many wonderful conversations with him over the years. I've spoken with Robert every time a book of his has come out. Since that fateful time in about 1994 or 5, I think, when Robert passed me his baton of books and writing, and he went off to be a writer. And look at what a fantastic writer he is. Um, it's not just that. It's This morning I was reading some transcripts of our conversations, Robert, and I enjoyed them so much, I realised that I was going to have a really good time. <laughs> so... <laughs> I left my little study where I've been working on my new book by myself to come out and talk with you. So I'm really happy that, that he's here and you're here and we can do this together. Thank you. Robert describes himself in this book as abandoned newborn, love-struck waif, contemplative bohemian, thespian, wanton, voice on the radio, monk, and so on and so on. There have been so many little Robert Joneses from Lane Cove. Robert, would you read for us from the beginning of this book? Because we love hearing Robert read, don't we? He's got a beautiful... Do you, some voice. of you will have heard a version of this first little bit before, um, when I gave a paper about ageing. Sunday night... His face beams down at me like God's. From a dome of bright light, everything gleams. Every blonde hair on his tanned forearm glistens as he fits my mask. It's a glossy, muscled forearm, used to hefting bodies. I've always been very taken with forearms, and this is a singularly lustrous, sinewy example. So tell me, Robert, he says gently, somewhere high up there inside his dome of dazzling light, Am I already dead? No, not yet. Soon. Have you had a good day? A good day? I give a muffled laugh, batting away the pain blossoming in my chest. Apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how, do we, how did you enjoy the play? Tom Lehrer, wasn't it? <laughs> They're losing me. These two paramedics in their fluorescent jackets, and they know it. Even I know I'm teetering on the edge of a big moment. And all the one with the burnished forearm can come up with is, have you had a good day? It's surreal. The doors of the hotel foyer hiss open and a man, a woman and two teenage children burst in out of the cold, squawking with late night excitement, catch sight of the trolley, the body and the yellow jackets and hurry off towards the lifts. You know, I croak as if it were a serious question, as if he really wanted to know. I'm always very polite. I have. I've had a very good day. And I have. I've walked the dog by the river, I remember. I've reread my play script aloud to myself in the sun. Flown off with it at dusk across the sea to Sydney. Mooched about, I'd have liked to frisk, in the gritty trashiness of Oxford Street still rumbling and screeching out there beyond the plate glass windows. Oh, and other things as well. I've enjoyed lots of other things. Now I cast my mind back. Would he want to know the details? Well, that's wonderful. He says, still gleaming, that's what matters. Really? This sounds unlikely. But before I can pick an argument with him, they are trundling me out into the night. I am spasming with cold. A siren is screaming. I glide through the doors. There's a lot of shouting. I slew left. I slew right. There are dozens of jarring voices. I feel clawed at, 
by all the voices, but for some reason, and I know it's strange, even as it's happening, they are all like noises off. My mind is focused on the gleaming forearm and the voice from up inside the dome of light. Have you had a good day? <laughs> Subsequently, you're in hospital and um, you come across Philip Larkin's poem. Um, yes. Tell me about his poem. Well, there's a poem of Philip Larkin, some of you will know it, called Days. What are days for? It's very short, very Larkinish, and some find it rather depressing. I didn't find it depressing. It was in a book by... Lodge, by Professor Lodge, called Deaf Sentence, and someone bought it for me to read. They thought I needed a little bit of English <laughs> wit. <laughs> and I've been thinking about days ever since this paramedic spoke to me. I don't know why, but that word, have you had a good day? Day, said with me. Why, why, why? And so when I came across that word, again, I thought that's the word I should ponder. It's the word day that I should ponder. And Larkin helped me, as Larkin can. He really can. He doesn't have any absolute answers, does he, to what <laughs> days are for? I mean, you probably know the poem. Can I end eight here, lines? So I've got it here. Brilliant. What are days for? Days are where we live. They come, they wake us, time and time over. They are to be happy in where can we live but days? Ah, solving that question brings the priest and the doctor in their long coats running across the fields. And I thought about what the priest and the doctor would have to say and what I would say back to them. And that, in a sense, is what the book is about. Larkin's a funny one, isn't it? Because he... He wasn't like you. He didn't... I don't think he had the sort of friendships that you value and treasure. He, he had one chair and a table so that if anyone visited him, they wouldn't stay for tea. No. Well, he, he really lived mean. in Hull, Ramona. He I lived know in he Hull. lived in Hull, but there are other people in Hull. <laughs> That's no excuse to... for bad behaviour. No, I suppose not. Friendship, like conversation is one of the things that keeps me alive. Friendship is more important to me, I suppose, than anything else in the world in a sense. Friendships are various, aren't they? You know what I mean. I do. I don't mean someone that you met in the tram yesterday and you then call my friend so-and-so. I think that friendship and conversation are two sides of the same thing in some ways. In fact, I would go further. I think in some ways travel is the third side to this very odd entity that fascinates me. I think they are all about befriending who you are yourself and then befriending what is deep inside someone else. And travel is where you're most naked, aren't you? Because you sometimes are in situations where you don't actually understand what's being said and where you almost don't exist. Mm -hmm. You have to make yourself exist, really. You have to put a lot of effort into it because there's no one there from home to tell you who you are. So you can be anybody, and that's the excitement of it. So there's quite a lot about travel in here, and of course the whole book is a conversation with you, in inverted commas, I suppose. I mean, it's not really with you because you can't answer back, but sort of but with you. But you do answer back, and that's the thing about Robert's writing. He... Um, you have little invitations, which I think you probably learnt on the radio. I learnt them on the radio. To, to um, invite people into the sentence and to say things like, as you know, or, you know. <laughs> and editors try to cut those out. Do they? Course. They do. They do because... But it's you not, fought no, for no, them, But I you? fought for them because I want to feel that I'm inviting you into my heart... Into my mind, of course, but into my heart in some sense. 
That's what I would like you to feel by the time you finish the book. You won't agree with me about everything. That's not the point, is it? I mean, you don't read someone in order to agree with them about everything. You read them because you want to be in their company, don't you? Mm. For a time, for some hours. And that's what I would like you to feel. You will think some of the things I say are outlandish, but then I love the outlandish. <laughs> you say, you, you mentioned days. One person said days to you, and then Philip Larkin's poem, Days, and you thought, days. days. That's what I must think about. And you say coincidences can be so vivifying. Oh, vivifying. <laughs> Anything that battles randomness <laughs> is vivifying. I mean, you sometimes use the word providential, don't you? You know, if you're feeling a bit mystical to describe the feeling that comes over you. I do try not to be mystical. Sometimes it's hard not to be, you know, particularly if you're lying on the 10th floor of St. Vincent, some people are dying around you. It's hard not to feel a little mystical sometimes, late at night. But I resist. I'm, I'm going to get you to read something about lying there in the hospital in one second. But this idea that, um, that the coincidence is vivifying and it's a task for you then, I mean, set by whom is this vivifying task? <laughs> Who is sending these coincidences? Well, yes, I mean, it I... could have been anything. It could, have, it could have been pot plant. Someone said to you, do you like this pot plant? And then somebody else walked in and said, Mr. Pot Plant is coming to lie next to you. And you'd say, pot plant, what a coincidence. Of it must course. be something different to Well, just you're, that. You're, you're really grasping at something that will say to you, I am part of a pattern. I fit in. I'm not an accident. Ah. I don't want to feel I'm an accident. I am. I, just, I know. That just reminds me of that, your first book, a, 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 a Mother's Disgrace, and feeling like an accident. <sighs> I feel as if I landed splat, that's true, rather than being born the way well, people like you were probably born. No, I was a splatter. We were splatter. <laughs> and that I'm a funny shape. I do feel that. You're not a funny shape. Oh, I am a funny no, you're not. shape. You're not a, who thinks he's a funny shape? He's not a funny shape. I am an odd shape. I know that. I don't quite fit in. But then I've tried to turn that to account, as you've tried to turn who you are, to account, that's the thing that you must always do. You know, I've been reading a bit of Montaigne, and I've been reading, you know, the odd Greek and the odd Roman, and one of the things that Montaigne says, much more elegantly than I can, he says, the great masterpiece of man is to live apropos. Le glorieux chef d'oeuvre de l'homme, c'est vivre a propos. And I didn't know what that could mean. What could that possibly Apropos mean? Apropos of. Exactly. There's a full stop after it. <laughs> a French friend who lives here in Melbourne gave me the line. I hadn't noticed it before. It's a great line. I thought about it, thought about it, thought about it. And then said Cicero, some Roman, said, the important thing is the fit between the way you think and the way things are. <laughs> I think that's what apropos means. And all my life, I have tried to find a better fit. Sometimes I've come up with a fit that isn't really very good either. Like what? Oh, <laughs> what well, are you doing with your eyes? You're rolling them back. I got married, didn't I? Oh, yeah. Was that a good fit? Well... You've well, just done I, it for the third time. Of I course, know. You're the wrong person to ask. <laughs> I'm doing it until I can get it right. I only did it once. No, of course I've made wrong decisions. I mean, we all do. But gradually, over time, I think the fit has become saner between mm. my way of thinking, intellectus in, in Latin, and the way things are. Race in Latin. And yet you say the older I get, the less sense anything makes. It doesn't how can that, make How can you have those both, both thoughts oh, at the I same can, time? Oh, I can, because 
I'm trying to get a fit. That's not really the same thing as sense. sense. I'm talking about, when I say sense, I mean the meaning of life. I'm not looking for the meaning of life anymore. I think that's what you look for when you're 14 or maybe 23, I don't know. I'm not looking for that anymore. It can look after itself. And, and does. And does, without me. I'm looking for a good fit. And slowly, I mean, I'm 70. I think the fit is getting better. Mm. So I think I'm living more and more apropos. Apropos, <laughs> read us that bit in the hospital. And this is not hospital porn, by the way. <laughs> I don't do hospital porn. What is hospital porn? Sorry to... What is hospital porn? If you don't know, you probably don't need to know. <laughs> is it like a thing? Is it a real a thing? Like, do people do people really enjoy hospitals in that way? Skip it. <laughs> I think when I'm old enough day. to know. <laughs> I've been there three days. I'm almost never alone in this white room except at night. And even at night, there's Larissa. She's indeed Russian, it turns out, just as I thought. This nurse who declared she wasn't Polish, and her name is Larissa, from Odessa. Another satisfying swipe at randomness. Odessa figures quite prominently in this play of mine, the one I've come to Sydney to see performed, set as it is in Russia. Odessa isn't in Russia, strictly speaking, but it might as well be. Not that I'm Russian, I hasten to add any more than a man is his wife. More Russian than Chinese, that goes without saying. Nobody could be less Chinese than I am, but not at all Russian. Yet I love my idea of Russia, not the real Russia. The small pocket of Russia still faintly smelling of Tsars and Turgenev that I got to know when I was very young, and I also love every syllable, every phoneme in the overflowing treasure house that is the Russian language. I love its tumult and its order, its play with infinite disguises, the theatre of it, the whip-cracking three-ringed circusness of it, its balletic perfection and peacock elegance, alongside its earthiness, its sibilance, its oohs and oars and cascades of syllables. How sad I feel when I admit to myself, as I must if I'm honest, that I will never know it as I'd like to. I'll never know it, for all my love of it, as intimately as even some ten-year-old street kid in Vladivostok knows it. Yet it's woven into my soul, it's the weft to the very warp I was born with. Since we're talking about Russian, I'll permit myself soul. I started weaving it in as a small boy. My first two Russian words, as it happens, were botanichesky sat, botanical garden, which I'd found on a Soviet stamp in my shoebox of foreign stamps. And even now, a whole lifetime later, I'm still weaving, very slowly now, and not so deftly, but I come back to the loom from time to time. All the same, I'm not in the slightest bit Russian. Well, possibly just a touch in my aesthetic responses, but that's the limit of it. Now we've established that she's Russian, just as I thought. Every hour on the hour, all night, Larissa switches into my room and asks me in Russian, with whom are you conversing? She's just making sure I haven't died again. <laughs> with Larissa, I answer hoarsely, Slarissa. Correct, she retorts, briskly trilling the R in the Russian word in approval, as if I've just amazed her by accurately calculating pi to the 14th decimal point. <laughs> then she sails out of the room into that mysterious, softly lit domain everyone comes and goes from, a place of faintly heard voices and quick footsteps, sometimes laughter, a place I can't see and can scarcely picture where people are fully and unconcernedly alive. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. The thing about being in hospital and 
you know, in intensive care units or that you are actually, all of these things are going through your mind and your body is not really moving very much and you look very sick and um, you're sort of trying to interpret the world outside your body in a, in a kind of way. It's going, you're going in and out, really, of being in the world and being in your mind and maybe being on the way out of the world. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting... Um, state to be in. And it's very hard to capture. You've captured it brilliantly. It's a fantastic description of that. Well, my mind was quite clear, but I was aware that when I started speaking, people didn't know what I was talking about. Or you would say one word, which was you know, a, a, a summary of the theme of the complex thoughts you were having. And it sort of came out, probably came out to people in the room as just... Hyacinths or something, <laughs> yes. Hyacinths, yes. And um, it, it is spooky to think that... I put a lot into that, trying to capture well, you did that it. sense you did that it. you have. And the trolley, the trolley, those, those times during the day when you can smell the trolley coming, the food. I love hospital food. <laughs> I love airline food. I love any food that comes in a little tray with compartments... <laughs> And I don't know why everybody's so rude about it. <laughs> you like the order. You like order. I like the order. I like the fact that it's served up to me. I like all the custard. I like trifle. I remember, I remember that you, were, you had a legendary um, taste for little pink iced donuts at the donuts ABC. Donuts with pink icing. They're not good for you, you know, they kill you. Almost <laughs> everything that's good that, that you like, it turns out. But, you know, there was you. such a sort of antithetical to the way <laughs> I imagined that you would eat. You know, what I, did just, you think I, would I eat? just thought something more sophisticated, you know, poppy seed cake, perhaps. I'm not sophisticated. Mm. I'm just not, really. I mean, I'm a but feat, you, a, but yeah, that's different feat. from sophisticated. Oh. Your, your range, your depth, your knowledge, your literary ease in all of these places is kind of sophisticated. Do you think? I think. I think. Do you think? Yeah. yeah. They're on my side with this one. I've got style. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I've always got depth, you see. That's now the you're, thing about but style. You actually, what, one of your, the things you like to do is you know, lead the reader along with, you know, wonderful references to great poets and thinkers and philosophers, and then there's something like an iced bovo at the end of the sentence. That's right. <laughs> One of life's great you joys. You like that, yes. don't you? you yes, like... I do. I like to undercut myself. I like people to feel that, really, despite the fact that I do enjoy talking about things that perhaps require some reading some background, some depth, that I take pleasure, as everyone else does, in daily things. I mean, they are the stuff of life. So the Ice Vovo is very important to me. I mean, I do talk in this book about the fact that dailiness sometimes threatens to overwhelm me. Doesn't it overwhelm you sometimes? I mean, just the, the dealing with all the things the drudgery, I suppose, of life. What, bills and things? No, not bills really, but getting up, you walk the dog, you have breakfast, and then you have to do the washing, then you have to bring the washing in, then you have to do the ironing, then you have to do the dishes, then you have to clean the house, and then you have to answer emails, and it just goes on and on and on and on, and then you go to bed and you try to read, but you're too tired to read, you fall asleep. <laughs> But don't you, aren't you, I mean, when I, I do those things too, but I, I'm always thinking about something else while I'm doing those things. I try. <laughs> I do try, and I try to circle round and round and go down, in this book at least, into the layers that are there if I give myself permission to sink down into them and bring them up to enrich my day. I mean, the book is about layered days. That's mm. what it's about. In the parts that you write about travelling, um, you, you all, you're always attracted to those places where you're going to see or feel perhaps something ineffable. 
it's hard to talk about the ineffable, of course, because it's not effable. I it's not effable, <laughs> that's right. Mm-hmm. But I, y- you, much more than me, are, are interested in going to, to see these places, to see people perform, I suppose, religious, um, um, religious acts or spiritual things. Yes. Or you want to go and sort of see whether you can pick up anything from I that. want to know what it feels like to be them, of course. I mean, you know, I need to escape domesticity uh, regularly, and it's, it's a, almost a rite, R-I-T-E, that I perform every year uh, to go somewhere that is in some ways behind enemy lines. Who if are the enemies? Just not people at home. Values that are not mine, Yes. So I will go to Algeria. I will go to, well, to Ladakh, for example. I went to a few months ago. Your journey to Ladakh? Uh, What about these people who, um, the Malaysian Sky Kingdom cult, who venerate a gigantic teapot, vase, and yellow umbrella? Yes, I put them in there as well. What are they doing? What do they think they're doing? I don't know what they think they're doing. I try not to be dismissive of other people's belief systems, but when it's the cult of the great spiritual teapot in the sky, (laughs) it's difficult, isn't it? What is the story of the great spiritual teapot in the sky? Oh, I don't know. The founder of it thinks that he is the Mahdi and that he is Jesus Christ and Muhammad all rolled into one and... I don't really think that we should spend a lot of time on him, but the Malaysian government doesn't approve of him, and I think he said to go to Thailand, actually, with his teapot. He also has a giant umbrella. That can be useful in those climates. Well, it can. (laughs) But I talk quite a lot about Hinduism, because... Why do I talk about Hinduism, do you think? Well, it's a very good example, you see. I don't really believe that Kali is a real presence in the sense that Mount Everest is a real presence or after dinner mints, for example, are real. You can eat them there. there. Mount Everest is something that you can see, that you can fly into. I don't believe that Kali is there in that sense. But in this story that I tell, which is a true story, Kali seemed to be there. Everything that happens to me in this story seems to be Kali taking her revenge on an unbeliever. But that can just be like a bad travel agent. Of course. But you see, I'm trying to put myself in the position of an Indian and see how they would see it. And that's how they would see it. Do you like going to India? Love going to India. Hmm appalling place Mm. and I love being there. Why? How can you bear it? Because, and here I give you the answer that André Gide gave when asked about why he liked going where he liked going and that Pico, not Pico Ayer, but that Donald Ritchie gave about why he likes Japan. I like myself in India. I find myself India interesting in India. And you see, I went to Turkey, as you did. Mm. I didn't find myself interesting in Turkey. It's to do, again, with the fit. We discovered that we both went to Gebekli Tepe. Um, I went about four years ago. Did you just go last year? Which is in the south, near the Syrian border. It was last year. It's, um, it's the most extraordinary archaeological dig where there's a 10,000-year-old standing stone system, really, and I went where they were just starting to um, they were just starting to emerge out of the it, landscape. Yes. Um, but when you went, but they were probably it was probably a lot more impressive. But what struck me was the the most beautiful ten thousand year old carvings of perfect animals, um, witty carvings of animals. Yes. Actually, all the animals I think were male, and they all had erect penises. I don't know if you noticed that. No, that's not the sort of thing I would notice. Yeah. <laughs> but it was in, it's important for the interpretation. I just went for the interpretation. 
Um, but I thought it was a knockout and I still can't stop thinking about it. But you, it didn't impress you the same way and I'm surprised. Yes, I went specially. It, it was very difficult to get to. Uh, Gobekli Tepe is uh, in, in a very isolated place down near the Syrian border in Turkey. But I did not find myself time traveling there, no. And when I travel, I like to time travel. I like to... But how can you not time travel when you've got a 10,000-year-old standing stone? I can only tell you it didn't happen. It's like Christmas. You think it's going to be fabulous. It arrives. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> we will agree to disagree about this. But also, why didn't you like yourself in Turkey? Aren't you the same? Why aren't you the same in Turkey or... I'm not at all the same in Turkey. Do you not see that? No, I don't. Explain it to me. Well, that's why I go to different countries, because I'm a completely different person in every different country. That's the wonderful thing that Enid Blyton taught me. Mm. <laughs> the magic faraway tree. I that love you, the magic faraway tree. I love you it. You can be anyone that you want, but I can't be anyone that I want to be in Battery Point, Tasmania. You can't at home be anyone you want. It's not fair to other people. The dog wouldn't <laughs> allow it. <laughs> but when you travel, you can't, if you travel alone. I've travelled with other people, I've travelled alone. On the whole, I prefer to be alone, I think, for that very reason. In India, I'm a prince. I'm never a prince at home. <laughs> OK. So you weren't a prince in Turkey. No. There's also something about an Islamic culture that I find very difficult to inhabit. I don't feel an immediate understanding and warmth, I suppose, towards an Islamic culture. I feel that Hinduism is somehow, well, I don't have to compete for attention, I suppose. I mean, I know that the Hindus, well, what can I say? You can enter Hinduism from any point in a way that you can't enter Christianity or Islam. Well, there's probably. so many stories. But you can never be a Hindu. You can never be a Hindu, no. I'm condemned to... What am I condemned to be? Yourself. Probably, yes. I probably can't be reincarnated as anything of anything of any significance. I don't know. But I'm not looking at it as a truth system. Are you looking at it as a system of beauty? As a storytelling system, and you can with Hinduism, because you can meet people who are extremely theologically sophisticated. Extremely. And some of my own, I suppose, still notional ideas about spiritual reality are very close to what some Hindus would think. And then you can approach Hinduism from the peasant level with Kali with skulls around her neck and blue skin and many arms. You can approach it from any level. We see, you can't really do that with Jesus, can you? You say something, you say, you say that Jesus wasn't very nice. Well, he doesn't come across as very nice to me. I don't want to offend people in the audience. But you think... actually identify as Christian so still. You wrote Christian on the last census, you say. I tend to put Christian because... I'm Christian in a way that you're not, I suppose. Well, I'm not Christian at all. At all. Not even Whereas a bit. I sort of feel that, you know, if I've got to pick a tribe, well, that's my tribe, I suppose. I was brought up in Lane Cove. Lane Cove was, in 1940-something, was Christian. But, of course, the book is dedicated to Susan Varga, who is a Hungarian Jew. Very ecumenical. Very ecumenical. But you were just talking about Jesus and how he wasn't very nice. He doesn't come across to me as very nice. I think that the Lane Co version of Christianity was too much about niceness and that our notion of love was a very restricted notion of love. Whereas the Greek words that are used in the Bible that are translated as love, well, I think there are about four of them, actually. There's storge, there's eros, there's agape, and there's philia. There are four of them. And we just 
have, well, charity, of course, is also used in the King James Version. But I think we interpret this as the kind of love that a nice uncle might show towards you. I don't think that the Semitic culture that Jesus was part of was particularly nice. I don't think that he meant to be nice. And Kali certainly isn't nice. It's, it's a, a kind of middle class bias that I have, that, that people should be nice. Well, I'm quite nice. Don't you think I'm quite nice? I do. I think you're nice. But I, nice is not a word I like to use. No. It's so, it's so, it's so weak teed. Well, that's right. Well, you know, it's Lane milky. Cove was. It's milky weak tea. Well, we had a lot of milky weak tea in Lane Cove. <laughs> I want you to tell us about infatuations because there have been many infatuations in your life. I love infatuation. I think you've got a very... Lovely part to read about infatuation. All right, I'll do that. I was just trying to think if there's a Melbourne equivalent of Lane Cove. Do you think there is? Well, I don't really know Sydney that well. Camberwell? Yeah? Would it be? Camberwell. It was a bit lower middle class in my day. Than Camberwell. Would it be East Bentley? Possibly. <laughs> oh, they're all saying yes, East Bentley. <laughs> Forget I said that. Mm. <laughs> As time goes by, I find that infatuation can strike in almost any setting, although rarely on trams. That said, I'm always mindful of the fact that E.M. Forster was famously and powerfully smitten on a tram in Alexandria, colouring the attitude to trams of a multitude of men ever since. Anthony is looking baffled. Anthony is the director of the play I've come to Sydney to see performed, and he's visiting me. Have I just said tram? Rarely at the beach, either, since my youth. If I bring to mind the detailed list I keep in a drawer at home of my major adult infatuations, it strikes me that while there is quite a variety of locations mentioned in the where column, there is only one mention of a beach. There's an airliner over Germany, twice. There's a dinner party in Paris, 11th arrondissement, high above the railway lines. There's a Turkish bath, there's, but wait a minute. Running my mind's eye down the list, I can see that ever since my 30s, the place in which I've been most likely to come undone is foyers. Yes, it's definitely in foyers that I've been most at risk of falling prey to a savage liking for someone lithe and mischievous particularly theatre foyers or art gallery foyers, at a pinch in libraries, but that was also in Paris. I'm not talking about an urgent desire for sexual intimacy. I'm talking about an impulsive and sometimes brutal sympathie, always misjudged, for someone I've just met. I have in mind the abrupt willingness to like someone I don't know at all, with a fraction too much intimacy too soon. Come to think of it, it was in foyers of a certain kind, not bank foyers, each to his own, that I first came under the spell of more than one of the visitors to this very bedside. What is it about these foyers and becoming besotted, I wonder? Even in Jane Austen's novels, theatres and their lobbies, as they were called, seethe with erotic possibility. Astley's in Lambeth, the Haymarket and the Theatre Royal, Drury Lane. Foyers were as much about eyeing and eyeing off as ballrooms. Anthony leans over towards me with a quizzical look on his face. I may have just muttered foyer or even Lambeth. <laughs> <laughs> the foyers are theatrical places that architects design, aren't they? They're sort of like the overture, aren't they, of a building. And, and you're supposed to think, hmm... What's going to happen? Something might happen here. Well, if you pick your foyer, you see, I think that you feel that your imagination may just dovetail with the imagination of someone in that particular foyer. And I would think that about theatre foyers. Some people here today might indeed think that about Westpac foyers. I don't know. But <laughs> I would think that about theatre foyers, that our imaginations must, uh, must dovetail, might dovetail. And that's what an infatuation is. It's the delusion that you're dovetailing. In fact, you've hardly been noticed by the other person. If you have been noticed and you're really dovetailing, dovetailing, you 
call it something else. Mm. Uh, well, a hookup. <clears throat> no. <laughs> <laughs> what? Not a hookup. Well, you call it falling in love. Or... Oh, falling in love. Remember? Oh, absolutely, yes, always. Cast your mind back. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about infatuations is they always end badly. That's the point of an infatuation. If it doesn't, you say something else. But I think they're beautiful. And, you know, I was married for, what, 11 years, but I can remember some of my infatuations more vividly than I can remember those 11 years, quite honestly. They were fabulous, fantastic, every single detail. And how long does the infatuation last? Is it, is it like a sort of an egg timer thing where you, it's boiled Oh, it's got it's to be cooked. more than three minutes. Yes. No, but, you know, it does it have a rhythm of its own, in, in, infallibly that I think three moment. weeks is three common. Three weeks. Yes, you don't eat, you don't leave the telephone. Well, in the old days, you didn't leave the telephone for three weeks. Then it just all becomes quite impossible, and you have to go out. <laughs> and... I and don't you know, miss the all, call. You the, miss the call, the call if it ever comes. It falls apart. You see someone else. You go to another foyer, <laughs> I suppose. But I do think infatuations are wonderful, and I haven't given up on them. <laughs> I refuse. I know I'm 70, and I should. No, why should you? What but else, you see, they're not sexual necessarily. Not That's necessarily. The point. They're emotional, they're... But what is it? Do you know about the sort of person that you are infatuated by? Oh, yes, yes, I've got this list. It really exists. It's no, in I my know, drawer. But the list, I thought the list was about places. Oh, no, no. It's an odd thing to keep that list. Oh, no, so no. Do you still keep it? It's like, in I the top I remember drawer. having one like that when I was 14, but I don't think I've added anything to it since I was 17. Oh, really? Yeah. What an impoverished... No, <laughs> but... No, I don't mean that there weren't things to add. There were many things to add, but I just didn't think I needed to keep a list in the drawer anymore. Oh, it's very interesting. You see patterns emerge, yes. Wow. And what Eye did you see? Colouring. Mm, what? Nationality. I'm not going to tell you the intimate details. Oh, Eye colouring. Like, what could it be? Brown, blue, hazel? There is a definite type yeah. that I'm susceptible to. Yeah. The Medina in Fez is full of them. <laughs> you had a bad experience, though, didn't you, with someone like that? The dangerous part of it. Yeah? Yes, it was Cairo, actually, not Fez, but the other end of North Africa. But yes, I mean, I'm susceptible. I admit it. I'm not proud of it, I just admit it. <laughs> Why not? And now, you say, you want to be old in a good way. I do. In a good way. I mean, when you're younger, you want to have a successful life and you want to have a family and you want to build a beautiful house and you, you want to make your mark in the world and you want to live in the thick of it. And now I realize I'm not in the thick of it. And it doesn't matter anymore. I want to be old in a good way. And I don't know how to do it exactly, but that's what I want to do. What would be a bad way? <sighs> To keep on trying to be important and well-connected and beautiful. I don't want to matter to anybody except those I matter to now. It's a book about mattering. It's not a very good word in English, is it? It's a sort of dry word. But it's hugely important to mm. me. I only matter to a handful of people, really matter. I think most of us probably do. I don't have children, of course. I don't have parents, brothers and sisters. I don't have family. I have elective affinities. I have kindred spirits. I, I matter to really a handful, two, three. I want to matter to them. That's all. That's all. Well, I think you matter to the people in this audience, um, and some of them will have questions now. So there are people with microphones. The rule is you uh, speak into a microphone to ask a question. So put your hand up and let us begin. And don't be shy because you can see he's very nice. Yes. <laughs> now don't say anything until you have that microphone or there'll be trouble. Glasses so I can see who's talking. That's better. 
What is the next place you want to travel to? Where is the next place you want to travel to? <coughs> Pardon me. Well, you see, it's not a very interesting reply. I want to go to Varanasi in India, and then I want to go to Jaisalmer in Rajasthan. And after that, I'm not sure. Bhutan interests me. But for some reason, Europe interests me less and less. It's not that I think Europe is not an interesting place. Of course it is. But it's a bit like visiting your grandparents, as I've said somewhere in something I wrote. It's not that they're not very dear to you, but you know, I've visited them a lot, and it's time to do something a bit more exciting. And Europe is not behind enemy lines. I mean, Emerson uses the wonderful phrase, beautiful enemies, to describe friends. That's the key expression. I want my friends to be beautiful enemies. That is, those I must fight in order to embrace. I don't have to fight a Frenchman in order to embrace him. I mean, we come from the same stock. We see the same movies, we, see, we read the same books, we have the same values. But I want to go to places where I will find beautiful enemies. So I don't have a really exciting reply, but I just thought Varanasi, it's time I was brave, and is it girded or girt my loins, and went there. You're not very polite about Scotland as a holiday destination, I notice. Am I not? What do I say about Scotland? Well, I Am think, I rude about Scotland? I think you are rude. I can't really remember what you said, but I just went to Scotland for a holiday to Orkney, which I found very interesting. And, and I think you said something like Scotland is a holiday that is sort of, it's too, it's, it's clean or it's, it's boring or it's like going to a hospital or something like that. Well, see, I wouldn't say it's boring. I no, would I'd say find that I might find said. myself boring there. But it's probably a bit like New Zealand, isn't it? I mean... And, and Tasmania. I think you thought it was like Tasmania Or Tasmania. Well. Yes. No, I, I'm happy to go to Scotland if No, well, you s if you're in print, you're not happy to go to Scotland. Oh, really? I, <laughs> I do contradict myself. That, that was a oh, difference. Oh, here we go. Refreshing, like a holiday in Scotland. <laughs> Refreshing. But not really erotically interesting or, you know, Not mysterious. restorative, deeply restorative, no. 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 Probably not. No, I, I, I really can't... Th I thought of Burma. I mean, that's not... I'm not being uh, smart when I say Burma, but I thought Burma might be a wonderful place to go before everybody arrives. <laughs> you do? Somebody, yes. Good. Well, I will, I will give it a big tick in my little list of places to seriously... Consider. Have we got another hand up? Um, when you were talking before about your fit in life, how you fit, years ago I heard a Brazilian say that you grow into what you are. So keeping that in mind, do you feel you fit more in the world now at 70? Not in the world. I hope not in the world. I don't much like the world, do you? I feel more whole, that's all. But when I spoke of fitting, it's a matter of fitting how I think with what I see and hear and know to be so. It's not that I want to fit in. I don't want to fit in. It's the last thing I want to do. I wonder even if you could write if you fitted in. I want to be a misfit in the world, perfectly happy. Of course, I have the luxury of living in a country, for all its faults, where you are not killed for being a misfit. There are some countries where I would be hanged for being who I am. I have that luxury, and I owe it to people who are more courageous than I am who have turned it into that sort of country, despite all the things that we are grumpy about in this country. You, um, you're interesting about gay marriage, which you don't approve of, talking about things that go on in this country. It's not a conversation you 
are interested in having? I think if you want to get married, get married. I mean, what I would say is that I don't think it's about equality. I think it's sort of saying, I want to have what she's having. Do you remember that scene? Yeah, I do from remember that film. When Harry met Sally, was it? I think before you say, I want to have what she's having, you should be quite clear about what she's having. <laughs> I suppose I also think that we've suffered enough. <laughs> I think the important thing about any relationship is the quality of the love. The relationship I'm in has been going now for 33 years or so. It's the quality, it's the sort of love. And everyone's, the quality of everyone's primary relationship whoever it's with. It could be with a sibling. It could be with a parent. It's the primary other in your life. It doesn't have to be a sexual other. The quality of that love will be different in the case of every single person in this room today. And that is the important thing. It's not the approval of some religious body or of the state. I know that it offends those who feel that marriage is sacred. I don't quite know what sacred means. They don't want same-sex couples to have the same sort of relationship that they consider to be a sacred one. Well, I've got nothing to say about that. I don't know what the word sacred means. I know what sublime means. And all sorts of other words. I've got quite an array of adjectives, but <laughs> I honestly don't know what sacred refers to in the real world. So please, have your sacred relationship. Go right ahead. But I don't feel I need it. <laughs> yes. Uh, Robert, I was going to ask you, um, is it enough to have um, one moment in the day that matters, or do you strive for everything to matter? What do you think? I'll settle for a moment. <laughs> I think, that, I think that, that you're doing well if you've got one moment that you could remember the next day and remember the next week and bring back up and look at from different angles. You can't ask too much of yourself or you start to feel that you're not measuring up in some way. I think one transparent moment a day a moment that allows you to look through it into many other moments is more than most of us could expect. I give an example, actually, of such a moment in the book. It's a moment in Tunis Airport. Do you remember that moment where somebody says something like, oh, what is it? Oh, somebody starts playing Silent Night, I think it is isn't it, on a flute? And that reminds me of Christmas. And it reminds me of singing uh, Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht at school in German. And that reminds me of, that reminds me of falling in love again. <laughs> Which everything reminds you of falling in love. Almost everything reminds me of falling in love again. <laughs> uh, sung in German. <laughs> yes. And that reminds me of Christmas has passed, and all sorts of other things. And so that moment becomes transparent. Do you see what I mean? Do you see why I'm using the word transparent? And if you can have one of those a day, well, you're doing well, surely, aren't you? So I reverie. So it's reverie, well, a lovely word. Isn't it a lovely word, that's reverie? Right. That's right. That's why I chose it. That's why you chose it. I didn't it. make it up. I didn't invent it. it. Took the French to think of it. Reverie, Yes. What about as a writer, do you feel like you, you need to achieve anything in a day, like a sentence or a paragraph Well, I still do up idea? to a point because I'm so Protestant, you yeah, see, yeah. and it's so hard to get rid of that. Uh, I look at the dog sometimes and I think, well, what, she's a, what has she achieved today? <laughs> Absolutely nothing, <laughs> but she's had a fabulous day. <laughs> Just fabulous from the moment she woke up in the morning. 
And I try to kill this desire in myself to achieve something. But, you know, it's, it's very ingrained. And I know that I do feel better if I've written a beautiful sentence. That's the most... Don't you think writing a beautiful sentence is wonderful? Yeah, I do. I wish I could it's do it more. So, <laughs> it's so deeply satisfying. Just one. Just, that was the wonderful thing about being a translator, feeling battling all day to translate a word, a word, a single word, and you find eventually at about 4.30 the word. And the whole day's been worthwhile just for that one word. Uh, true, this is true. It's a pleasure that's difficult to, to describe. So, yes? Do you read as you, as you travel authors that present enemy territory or do you read within your comfort? Zone. Do you know what I do when I travel? I don't know if there's an exact answer to that. I tend to read books that are about something completely other from where I am. For example, I wouldn't read Passage to India in India. I wouldn't read Heinrich Hara on Ladakh in Ladakh. I would read that in Battery Point. Uh, who did I take with me to India? Probably a murder mystery. Did I take Joan London? No, I don't think I could have. Did I take Michelle de Kretz? I would take something completely other so that I was just looking at where I am through my eyes and listening and tasting. That's what I would do. But some people prefer to do it in a different way. They prefer to be reading a book about where they are. I can't tell you how many people have said to me, I have taken night letters with me to Venice. You see, I think it's the wrong thing to do. I would like you to read night letters at either before you go or afterwards. And the world is divided between people who do the before and people who do the after. In Venice, read, uh, I don't know, you know, read uh, Rose Tremaine or someone completely different. I'm in the other camp. Are you? Yes, completely. Yes. I'm a SWAT. Right. And you have to know as much as you can about where you are and what that means and what's happened over there and why this is like it is. Complete immersion is my philosophy. Good. See? <laughs> One last question, I think. Oh, lucky last. Thank you both for a very nourishing lunchtime. Pleasure. I wanted to take you, Robert, back to the notion of um, fit. I think you described it as the place between what I think and... What is? What is. And I'm just wondering, is there any political responsibility in the what is or the world around? Or how do you see that political or ethical need perhaps to reshape or participate in reshaping the world around? I'm not very good at it, I have to tell you. I mean, I don't suppose you can be good at everything. I think the Soviet Union kind of beat politics out of me in a sense. I think that it's just not what I'm good at. I feel strongly about all sorts of political issues. I'm just a, a grumpy reader of things like the Monthly and the Saturday Paper and probably the Fairfax Press rather than the Australian, if you see what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think I'm good at acting I don't think that's my forte. Do I feel guilty about it? A little bit. But you can't be good at everything. I think I get loud and intolerant when I start talking about politics. Um, what Robert is very good at is writing this book, What Days Are For. It's beautiful, it's perfect, as I said. And if I were you, after I clap him, I would be running up there to buy it from that corner and then standing there on the other side so that he will sign it for me. That's if I were you. Please thank Robert to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.